Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this round table, or shall I say square cork table, uh, at IKEA Temporary in Milan. Uh, my name is Johanna Agerman Ross, and I'm the editor and founder of Desenia Magazine, a biannual design magazine. And I thought maybe we could all go around the table introducing ourselves. So, Bjorn, do you want to start? Thank you. Uh, my name is Bjorn Lok, and uh, I'm the range manager at IKEA for lighting, and I've also been responsible for the initiative that we have at IKEA called uh, IKEA Home Smart, where we're now launching the wireless charging collection. Hello, I'm Matali Krasset. I'm an industrial designer. I started collaborating with IKEA four years ago, and I'm showing a kitchen here in Milan with them. Good morning. I'm Jerry Dufresne. I'm the range manager for kitchen at IKEA. And I've been working also on the conceptual kitchen that we have here today in IKEA Temporary. And I am Ilsa Crawford, I'm principal of Studio Ilsa, um, and also head of Man and Wellbeing at the Design Academy Eindhoven. And we've been working with IKEA at Studio Ilsa on a range of furniture and other pieces, lighting, accessories, for the last three years, which is showing here in Milan. Great. And I'm Marcus Engman. I work as head of design for IKEA since a couple of years. And uh, yeah, I'm responsible for the design and identity of IKEA. Great. Well, it's a really great and unique opportunity to have you here all in one room, large room, but uh, around one table um, during Milan. Um, the, the kind of theme and the topic of discussion this morning uh, came out of, well, what you've been doing here at IKEA Temporary uh, and also kind of out of a quote by you, Ilse. So I will start by reading that just to sort of set the tone. So Ilse said, the more virtual our, our lives become, the more we, create, we crave the physical. For the Cinelig collection, we used natural materials as they engage our senses and connects us to ourselves, to our feelings and our homes. It seems that our, our basic human needs change to include things like constantly being connected or having to charge a mobile phone whenever you stop somewhere. Our lives clash and collide with technology at kind of every twist and turn, every, every, ever so often and much more than before. Uh, as the concept kitchen here in the exhibition um, shows at IKEA Temporary, the main location for this interaction seems at the moment to be the kitchen and I think that you have presented that really well here. So I think that we should kind of focus the conversation around this idea of the kitchen as the new frontier, uh, con connectivity, food and the future of designing for the home. So to start out with that, I think that it'd be really interesting to hear each of your opinion on this shift from uh, the kind of public sphere, the, um, the what we do collectively as the kind of leader uh, for, for innovation to this move towards the home. I think that's something that's become extraordinarily strong in the last few years, that we see the home as the kind of frontier for innovation. Uh, for example, you know, uh, um, t uh, t um, Tony Fidel from um, Nest believes that every single device in your home will be connected to the internet within 10 years. Um, you also, uh, in, in the Wired editorial on the wireless charging from IKEA, says actually the home is uh, where innovation within this technology will take place. It's a much more natural place for things to happen. So it'd be really interesting to hear each of your opinion on, on this shift to the home as the kind of frontier for innovation. So. Bjorn, you look particularly charged. Do you ah. want to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I think it's a, it's a great topic, though. I think uh, starting off though, in terms of innovation in the home, I think IKEA has always innovated starting from the home and life at home. And uh, if you take the wireless charging coll collection as such, has exactly the same starting point as everything else we're doing at IKEA. It's starting with, with modern life at home and identifying the activities that's going on in a home. And one of the activities that is occurring in a, in a modern home is, is how you find your charger, how do you charge your phone, how do you charge your tablet, and, and so on, and working with your devices in a, in a nice manner at home. So I think, and that's super important to re remember and hold on to, that uh, integrating technology, or as you say, I mean, connecting things to the internet just for the sake of it is not going to do any good. But if you rather see about solutions rather than technology as such, because technology is just an enabler to create a great solution. And uh, I think uh, from a IKEA perspective, that is our responsibility to hold on to that, hold on to our starting point for innovation in life at home 
then if we solve it using technology or we're solving using a, a different type of shade or a different type of table, uh, it's, it's part of the journey how we, how we come to the solution. Ilse, you deal very much in your work with this relationship between the kind of private and the public in terms of creating much more kind of comfortable public environments in a way. So what, what's your kind of take on this, on the move from well, to I the home of New Frontier? There's a distinction in my mind between the home and feeling at home. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, as human beings, the desire to feel safe, the, the fear of alienation, of feeling vulnerable, you know, they're just basic human primal drives. So whether that is in the public sphere or whether that's in the private sphere, I think it doesn't, you know, it's, it's the distinction I think today is much less relevant. After all, now with technology, we want to feel at home everywhere. Um, and also at home, we are sharing our space. So. The, the borders are incredibly blurred, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to feel like we belong wherever we are. And I think design has a very interesting role to play in how to make us as human beings feel at ease. I think it's kind of nice also if you look upon it, as you say, what is the home right now? When people move around a lot and they, they travel a lot, if you know people who travel a lot, they, you bring along some items also to make your... Mm your new home every night, you know, if you travel in hotels and stuff. That's a very common thing. So that is changing. Natalie and Björn? Yeah, so you need to perhaps find a, a new way to have a home core uh, because as you move a lot, you know, you need to, in a way, be more careful of what belongs to you, what is, uh, in fact, in, in your memories, in uh, the, the stuff you, are, you have around you create your own personality and in this, uh, in this way you are in a way surrounded by less project but more you made a m more bigger selection you know so it's quite interesting in that way what the concept kitchen project tried to do was integrate everything into one space in the kitchen where you could really be around all the technology and it was there when you wanted it but it was, it was gone when you didn't. I mean, it became a, an every kind of meeting place for, for children or cooking or whatever, or even charging things that you wanted to charge. It was, it was a, it's a very nice like, way of, sort of having the technology without having it sort of visible in the kitchen. Isn't that the route that we're taking also in general, to go for not gadgets, but invisible stuff, just build it in instead, make things smarter without making them visible? What is interesting is also talking about mobility, you know? Kitchen is uh, the activity space, you know, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the home. So you have a lot of energy here. So it's the, the best you give freedom to this activity to go from one thing to the other, the better it is for the, the people, you know, to, so it, it's going in this way. But I think it's, it's interesting in terms of life at home. I mean, I mean, if we identify the boring things at home, really, I mean, boring, ugly cables being around, you know, cleaning is quite boring and washing up is boring. If we tap into those dilemmas and solve these in a, in a really nice manner, it's an easier win than going after the things that are already working quite well in the home. And Sounds like a good business idea, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> but I think upgrading the ordinary is by far the most interesting area because those are the things that people really do, they really need, their physical reality. So addressing that is so much more interesting than creating abstract ideas of, you know, rooms you might use, aesthetics you would be potentially seduced by. I mean, it's just, it doesn't make sense. You want to actually address the lives that we actually lead and then upgrade them, make the ordinary extraordinary. I think it's, that's, I think for me, where the interest lies. Was this a concern for the Concept Kitchen 2025? I mean, the Concept Kitchen based was the first, the first part of the kitchen was very much based around the table and what would be the new meeting place in the home. We said the table would be it. And so how could you sort of transform all the other things that you need in the home, whether it's cooking, whether it's recharge, the things that you bring with you, they sort of live there as well. And when they're gone, the functionality that, that charges them also disappears. So it was, it was making sort of a very sort of social place around the table for cooking and, and socializing where the concept kitchen has sort of cookware that doesn't get hot. So children can be very much doing something beside you while you're cooking and there's no chance of sort of burning yourself or it's a, it's a very safe and sort of inviting kind of environment.
But the table in general, I think, is a really interesting discussion. We have had that. We have had it. We talked about it within PS. We have talked about it also. There is something going on around the table. Yeah. Well, I mean, which if is you interesting for the future. People want to collaborate, communicate, be around a table. I mean, if you're in a space, no one sits on a sofa anymore. You know, you sit around a table. That's your social space. And it's also an active way of, yes. of sitting. And it's an active way of approaching people instead of a sofa, which is extremely passive. Yeah. Well, it was designed <laughs> I think that to there be, is wasn't something, it? Yeah, it's designed to be it's that way. It's a power way. But, but thing. But that is also the times which are changing. And I think that's, uh, you're going to see more of tables. Speaking of the, the table in the concept kitchen, we, we could have made the table out of anything, but we made it out of wood. It's possible to have induction embedded into the wood. And we know right now that even though tech, people have a craving for technology or using technology, the table in itself isn't technology. Mm. We have in the exhibition a couple of new tables that we're uh, sales starting now that are made from new kinds of veneers, more tactile surfaces that people want to be closer to surfaces like cork or wood, something that has life to it. Um, and that is a very interesting part of the concept kitchen. Well, I think you're touching onto something very interesting there, Jerry, in terms of that uh, even though you might have a, a very intelligent or a, or a solution with, with lots of technology, that the tactile and emotional experience is so important that it's not becoming just a high-tech interaction because that you're not seeking. You're still seeking that tactile experience and the, I mean, the feeling of this. Everyone, when we sat around this table, everyone started to, to touch the surface because it has some kind of warmth to it that you want to interact with. And uh, not to forget that, it's, it's really a both and how you, how you create the solution. Well, it's and, isn't it? And I think our culture has made us believe that the body is one thing and possibly lesser and the mind is another. But, you know, obviously they are integrated and obviously you want to bring the world together. I mean, we were chatting earlier about this rather interesting court case that's going on in the US right now where... Um, an older man is being taken to court for having sex with his wife. That's <laughs> slightly irrelevant, funnily enough. What is really going on is his wife has dementia. And so it's really an argument between um, her family who are saying, you know, she can't make a rational choice, and the um, home where she lives who are saying that's absolutely not correct. You know, we deal with people who have a physical, emotional presence through their senses. And actually, the sense of touch is the first and the last sense to um, develop and, and for, to go. And that her humanity is, in fact, defined by her senses. So it's really a very interesting test case about which one is boss or is it both? In terms of those sort of senses, it's something obviously what, as you talk about in terms of the design and tactility uh, of things seems to be of uh, a kind of a certain acuteness at the moment almost. Uh, uh, just in February we had Vince Cerf, uh, the Google chairman, saying that, you know, he's warning of a digital dark age, that, you know, everything that we uh, sort of share with each other as memories happen online, you know, it's through, you know, through Instagram photos and we don't print them anymore, you know, emails, we, you know, we don't sort of file them in anything else but like kind of a file on our computer. So the physical memory will exist um, only, well, you know, as albums maybe know from 20 years ago and so on. So um, with that, it seems that we have this shift towards kind of valuing the, the, the more physical aspects of the objects that surround us. I mean, like, if you look at something like the Milan Isalona Furniture Fair, material is ever important you know there was a face even at ikea when things were you know a lot of laminates but you know now you can enjoy things like cork and you know you can enjoy beautiful kind of stone materials or you know innovative kind of new textiles and so on so are you noticing this shift uh, you know as our kind of day-to-day -day lives live much more online and in, in the virtual world we do kind of somehow value the, the phys physicality of objects much more? Is that something that you, within your, li within your daily working lives, as designers, researchers, kind of consider and think about? Maybe, Marcus, you want to? I think that that's a really big thing for us right now. And, you know, as you say, we have changed a lot when it comes to surface treatments and also looked upon maybe what, how to measure good quality. Because good quality within mass production is to have that everything should be on an even quality or the same kind of looks on everything. 
And that's the mother of, of everything bad when it comes to tactility, I would say. So you have to, to dare to do things with a, with a difference, a natural difference in everything we do. Um, and um, yeah, that's why we have gone into cork, that's why we have gone into things like uh, oil and uh, waxes again. And also to actually look upon things like this that we did together with Ilse, when you manufacture for differences, you know, the amount of, of of uh, oxygen that we put into the uh, to, uh, to uh, our production units, we make that uneven to get uneven results because we think it's good to have unique pieces to work with uniqueness in in, uh, in mass production. I think that's that is maybe one of our biggest challenges for the future. But it's an interesting one. I mean, I think for sure when you spend all day, you know, with something that has very little material. Quality. I think your hunger for tactility is huge. But it is also true that production was a very centrally driven thing and it was about de risking, about, you know, hose down, wipe clean, and those were the sort of values that people shared. But now I think there are more platforms for people to express a desire for something different. So there's much more of a conversation going on, I think, between the consumer and the manufacturer and therefore I think there's been much more research and development into for example coatings that are more natural more tactile now that sort of didn't happen before it was much more centralized and you know decisions were made it's without also, that conversation it's also how you set up the product development yes uh, actually how you do this if, if it's just a designer or just an engineer the way that we try to do is to work consumer engineers and developers in like a team to get the learnings from each and everybody and, and on equal terms also. Then you can up, come up with, I would say, new and quite good solutions on doing this, which we haven't done from the past. It's been very much engineer driven, I would say, a lot of the production. Some of the, some of the new uh, surfaces that Marcus is talking about, the hard wax or hard wax on, or oils on bamboo, when you open the product, they actually have a smell to them of wax or wood, which is kind of another kind of connection with actually the, the surface, because it does, it, the, some surfaces that we've had in the past didn't smell of anything. And now you actually get a connection of, of the material, isn't it? When we, did, we launched a collection recently called um, Rim Force, it's, a, it's um, visible food storage for the home. And we found that in the last maybe 15 years, food kind of disappeared from the kitchen. So we worked with a, a children nutritionist on what would, how could we kind of interpret sort of visible food storage and what would that mean to children. And we've sort of just launched these products and they've been extremely well received because people want to see food in their kitchen and sort of see spices, see coffee, see fruit or hang it on the wall. And in the collection we also have an iPad holder so you can easily bring sort of the technology with you and integrate it into where you have a few spice plants. It's been extremely well received. But it's visceral, isn't it? Of course we want to surround ourselves with food. We're cavemen. I mean, mm. it doesn't have to be translated in an old way, but, you know, in many ways, it's not natural to hide food away. No. I mean, we it creates food waste also. If you hide the food, if you don't see the food, then you buy too much. So it creates a lot of waste, which doesn't make sense either. The concept kitchen, the refrigeration and the food storage, I mean, there's two different levels. One is very sort of technology with technology with the induction food storage. There's no fridge, it's all visible. So you sort of, you have a total control of your food inventory at the same time. And then there's something that's very sort of old school, which is sort of the clay st fruit storage, which stores things in a very sort of humid way and over time. So you get sort of both scales in the same space. It's a very nice way of store food, storing food. Isn't there something about that? also letting things age. You know, there was an era within design and, and manufacturing where, where everything should be the same after 20 years. It should look exactly the same as straight from out of the factory. I don't think that people measure quality in that way anymore. It's about aging gracefully instead. And also age from out of your use as a person. So even if you buy the same kind of table, it's gonna be different after a couple of years in, in uh, different environments. And that's a beauty also. Well, it ages with you. <clears throat> Rather like husbands, you know, you don't see the difference over time. <laughs> <laughs> but Bjorn, in your field, the, the aging is a potential problem because obviously uh, the technology is sort of ever-changing and ever-evolving and 
you know, you need to keep up with that within your work of sort of in, in, in inserting technology into the design of the daily life. So how, how do you look at the aging process in design? Well, it's, uh, it's definitely not the uh, beauty of having an operating system age gracefully and be completely obsolete in uh, four years' time. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the, the we have to deal with this in a really careful way in terms of how we work with, if we know that things are going to be upgraded or, or changed over time, that we actually manufacture around that to make it upgradable. So you can simply click in or click out or you can simply download something to upgrade it so we don't build in technology that becomes old or obsolete and uh, we are really paying attention to this when we create the solutions and uh, as Marcus mentioned the the intention is really to make invisible and seamless solutions so it's not about selling technology that's not what we're doing it for but if technology or software or a digital interaction is the solution to the problem you have to make sure that it's compatible what's out there and one of our main paths when we're doing this is not at all to build our own standard. It's not that we want to, to build something that this is unique for IKEA. We, it's completely the contrary. We want to be friends with everyone. We want to be compatible with, with the large players in is driving uh, the digital development in the world. But and to be honest also, Bjorn, it's a lot of learnings for us here. We come from a business which is like extremely slow, the home furnishing business. It's a really slow business and, and uh, working with technology is vice versa. So we have to learn. We had an interesting dialogue when we started the, the um, of, well, we're in the second phase of IKEA uh, HomeSmart and uh, we talked about that uh, uh, 10 months before sales start we, we freeze the design and we freeze everything and we plan for, for the launch and uh, the partners we collaborated with they looked at us with big eyes and said well we don't even finalize the software until we sales start it. The first thing the customer <laughs> does is to download the software. Well uh, you know we're meeting a different world, that's, uh, that's for sure. I think that's pretty interesting. What about working with you know, beta testing when it comes to, to uh, normal product design also for uh, home furnishings? That would be kind of nice. Incorporate the, uh, our, our uh, consumers but that, on a much larger scale. That beta testing does happen to some degree though. I mean, you do research within the homes of people, how they use things, at least with the technology that you developed, right? We do that with everything. Yeah, with everything. So, what 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 is that? What does that testing involve? Uh, well, first of all, it's it's us going home to people mm -hmm. all over the world and talk to them. I think there's big big difference between doing a home visit and talk to real people and doing research through research companies. We've learned so much just by talking and interacting with people. Uh, and then second phase is to try things out in those people's homes also and see how you relate to it for real, you know, those, those everyday moments. It's hard to, to uh, research a thing like that. It's more or less being curious and trying. Anthropology. Yeah, a little yeah. bit like that. Mm. That's true. Mm. Matali, you made children like a very central part of the kitchen that you uh, created here for IKEA together. How come you wanted to kind of make this statement? But if you look uh, a little bit closer, you, it's just like the normal evolution of the kitchen. First, uh, we opened the kitchen because before it was in a separate uh, space. Then uh, right now you do like an island and it's completely different how the people are, are cooking because you can really exchange with the other. And so the next step is to integrate all the activity in this island. So just to have this little cabin or cabana in the center for the kids so you will be able to look at him and give his, his own space so he can organize it himself as he wants. And at the same time, you have your own activity. I think it's changing a lot the way you, you act in the space and also it's giving the, the kid a kind of autonomy. So for me, it's really on that point that we can go on, on developing, organizing the space in a different way. It's like putting so the kids living in together, the center. It's a very, the center of my work in a way, but then you have different uh, way to do it different, de depending on the projects. So it's, it's for me, it's just a normal evolution, you know? It's how, and with this I IKEA method system, you, you, you can really start and, and create your own concept. Uh, so if you want to 
create your own kitchen like that, then you, you find a way to do it with the, the modules. And it's, uh, so I would like the people to take a kind of st statement, what, what are my value and how I can transform this value and organize the space according to this value in terms of education, transmission, in terms of uh, how, what can I inject in my body. All, the, all these are connected in a way. So, and then you need tools, you need platforms, you, know, you, you need an uh, intelligent object to be able to, to do this. You know? But it's a long process because uh, you think there is a kind of inertia at home. You, know? you have existing structure, very heavy, you know? so you, you need to take people's hands and uh, show them. So I, that's why it's very interesting you know, to do such concepts. Because everything is there, you know. You just need to, to have a different attitude toward life, you know, and and be able to, yeah, to do statements and to and to to just take the decision to do it. Also, I mean, it's not a matter all, of yeah. money; it's just a matter yeah. of attitude. Yes. So it's yeah. I completely agree with you, and I think all design in the end is the embodiment of a social and a cultural norm. And very often the norm outlives the changes in society. And it's quite bizarre in a way if you look at, you know, the idea of the kitchen, no matter what it looks like, it's still from a time when there's the idea of the woman being in the kitchen or, the, you know, these two people just cooking. It's, it's not reflecting the society that we actually live in. You know, the cultural diversity, the numbers of people in that space, how they cook, etc. I mean, it's fascinating how old models often vastly outlive their sell-by date. But yes, I completely agree with the fact that you have to... You must be able to, to provide to... diversity of life. Mm. So you, you must find and designers and industry together ways to bring back this diversity because it's what brings relief to life. Rather than, rather than guessing how people live or sort of assuming how people live, we often go out to people's homes and not only sort of observe what they do in their kitchen, but I go shopping with them to see how, what kind of food do they actually buy and then how do they, we actually try to prepare a meal in different, different parts of the, the world, so how do they actually use their kitchen and the new kitchen system that she talks about, how do, how, I go to people's homes that have recently bought a new kitchen from us and then sort of ask them why they did it or how they combined it and some of the findings are like really interesting and they, they could, so they start talking about they don't like the buttons or how the interaction is with the technology and the appliances. They find it too complicated. You know, people don't want sliders. They want sort of a sort of a more retro type of interaction. They, they want an analog experience. With, they don't want these things that we think they want. So we can we're able to make these adjustments in the product development according to how what people really want. I mean, so you're on your iPad all day, but when you want you go to cook, maybe you want a more authentic experience with, with how you do that. And we, we find that out a lot when we do these sort of customer, not focus groups, but actually customer questions in their homes. It's very interesting. They, they want the technology, but they don't want the complication of the interaction. They want a very simple user interaction with how to, how, how to make it work. And what, as, as was just said, the, the analog experience when you're cooking, maybe you've, you've been there all day touching and then you go to cook and you want another type of experience. Maybe you don't want to spend time learning how to interact with things either. It should be, you know, obvious instead. That's the, that's the other feedback that we have from sort of the appliance development is it has to be extremely simple. Sort of all the less features, the better. I mean, it's, it's not that it's just on off, but it's a very, very functional uh, part. It, it doesn't have to do a lot. Uh, that's what people are after. Yeah, I mean, no friction, intuitive. That's what they pay you to do. I read an interesting, That's the hardest part. That's the hardest part. <laughs> I read, read an interesting quote the other day. It said that the user interface is like a joke. If it needs explanation, it's pretty poor. And it's, uh, I think it's a good thing. You know, it needs to be intuitive and it needs to be something that you automatically know how to, how to use. So. Talking about this kind of curiosity about people and looking into people's lives, that's obviously something that uh, is a great value to you as a company at IKEA. Um, um, but something like this, the IKEA together here in Milan, seems to be a kind of opening up of you a bit. I mean, sitting doing a round table and actually talking about your design processes and your research is something that hasn't been so prominent uh, actually about IKEA, uh, I think, ever really. So is there a kind of feeling of a move towards kind of 
people being able to be curious about you as well and you opening up a little bit more? I mean, is that a, a kind of overall plan or intention? Maybe, Marcus, you can talk about that a bit. I think, you know, since the world is becoming more and more complex, it's important to us to use more brains. So that's the starting point. Uh, I don't think that we're smart enough within our company to solve everything. So let's invite people to do that instead. So that's one of the ideas. And then we have set up on a, on a journey to say that we're not about making things, we're about making things better. And then to do that, you have to know how, you know, what are the things that we could make better? What would make a really big change out there? And then you have to interact much more, both with production and the factories and people out there and our stores, all of the designers around the world. So it's more like working in a collective way. Then on top of that, I think it's also about, you know, it's, 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 it's not all about research, it's about trial and error also. And uh, I'm a firm believer in trial and error when it comes to product development. To be able to do a lot of mistakes, to also use our... <coughs> the greatness of IKEA is that we have a lot of resources. If we could use those resources for you know, doing more mistakes, then we would find out a lot of new stuff that nobody else has done before. So that's the track for the future. It's about doing more mistakes. But also, I mean, you touched on it earlier, and I think it's so important that historically, you know, companies were defined by their internal processes. And I think it's almost impossible not to start to make decisions driven by that to too great an extent, despite all this talk about reaching your consumer, unless you actually really invite your consumers to be part of the process, you will inevitably start telling them what you think they should have, which are yes. inevitably going to be driven by your priorities. Mm. And that, you know, just produces the wrong outcome. It's a collaboration. It has to be. Yeah, I mean, you have to be also extremely open-minded. And I think that's a big change also for a lot of yeah. big companies now to, to say that maybe I don't own that great idea from the very beginning. It's not about enforcing ideas on people, which is a, a very different way of working. Jared, did you find this in your If work? we, in the kitchen and kitchen and dining business, we think about food a lot, which is a little bit sort of the celebration that we have here, everything about food. And we invite people in different ways. We, we, we have not sort of research, but we bring people together and we said, can you tell us all the frustrations you have in your kitchen? And so we get a, a very much a lot of images from like 3,000 homes of the sink area and people telling us what is it that they don't like about sort of the main area of the house which is so simple but it's actually it, it's used for washing a baby it's used for washing their clothes they, they want it hygienic so how can we solve all those problems around that area so we bring all this information we, we also ask people around um, home chef if you were like if you were a, if you classify yourself as a home chef what would you like to have and you could be a home chef maybe once a month, but you, you still want to have certain things. We get a lot of this sort of customer contact with what do they want. And it helps us a lot to understand sort of how to do good stuff. The right kind of things that people are looking for. It's fun. Um, in this most recent issue of Decennia, we did actually quite a big piece on um, the kind of landscape of food design because there's three uh, quite big food design courses that have been started in the, in the last year actually, one here in Milan, one in Eindhoven and one at Parsons in New York. Uh, so, you know, very respected schools uh, that are doing um, interesting work within design in general and that they now sort of divert their focus to food is, is very intriguing. And it's interesting also to hear how much you talk about food because IKEA food is of course a big part of IKEA but you know when you think of IKEA you don't necessarily think of the food, you think of the furniture. But it's interesting to see how this idea of food design which as we talk about in Decenio maybe at the moment in a more conceptual stage where you kind of it's more about the conceptual interventions and interactions and special events but the real problems around food design are things like what you were talking about you know food waste you know people actually uh, buying more food than they need uh, while they're being like you know another part of the world a, a, a very big lack of food for people and it hits me hearing you talk that a lot of these things, by addressing them within our daily lives, within our homes, within our kitchens, could make such a big impact, not just sort of for our own lives, but for like globally. And I think that, yeah, it, it's an intriguing thing to think that even even the smallest thing has such a big impact, you know, elsewhere. I mean, that's that's not a new 
thought in a way, but just hearing how you talk about it really kind of it dawned on me that, well, for example, working with food designers mm -hmm. could be a really interesting way forward in order for you to kind of uh, develop what you're good at. So, I mean, did you speak to food designers within your uh, I, uh, well, uh, concept project? I've had contact project? with food designers before. Some of the food designers that I've met have, have worked more with how food looks, like for children's rehabilitation in hospitals, and that's how I, I think it's a very nice way of, of food food design. We work a lot with uh, designers sort of interpreting about food storage. We, we look a lot into food. Uh, what do people have at home and how can we store it in different ways? What if, depending on the type of diet that you have, what kind of fridge might you have in the future? If, if you have a more sort of vegetarian diet, what does that mean to your food storage? How would you have it? If you have, if you, uh, have different kinds of diets, how would you sort of interpret that in, in food storage? We've used food, food designers or food design researchers for, for that type of, of work. Ilse, is this something that you kind of work with in, in your daily life in, in the office as well? Because food, I know, part, plays a big part just of your kind of um, yeah, daily um, life. Yeah. Completely, and I think, you know, Alice Waters' Edible Schoolyard project put it very well, the idea that basically all of human values are embedded in that food chain. From seed to table, you can teach all the human qualities, really, that bring out the best of us as human beings, from growing something, to nurturing it, to harvesting it, to sharing it, to preparing it, and so on. Um, and within the studio, that's very much how we practice. Um, you know, food is very much a way that we come together, you know, rather than sort of meetings in dark rooms off a long corridor. I try to ban those. Um, but on another level, as an educator, I think that our connection to food is so important. Our awareness of food, which I think can be translated through design, is really critical because I think in invisibility lies all sorts of horrible stuff. So to make food more visible in our physical world, I think, is so important. And the knowledge, as you said, around storage and so on starts to connect you to food in a whole new way and I think that you know is a really important beginning I think it's also important to start early start Absolutely. with kids start with kids I think that's really the starting point when it comes to this and on all levels I mean for example well, there's a project in the department at the moment a girl who's trying to work out how to make food and health a very visible and seductive, desirable part of your life so that you can really start to understand easily and legibly what kind of foods you might eat for different sorts of conditions, whether they're simply a hangover or to more serious conditions, but in a way that's not, you know, Excel sheet, that's intuitive rather than simply learnt. And I think that is the power of design, is that it can make something that's knowledge, you know, sort of the intellect can become a physical thing. An intuitive thing. Could you really eat yourself out of a hangover? Is there learnings yes. about that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I couldn't help but notice that one of the promo pictures for the kind of wireless uh, charging pad was kind of in a really messy kitchen environment with loads of flowers and eggs around it. Well, I don't, I, I'm not expecting you to have created that picture, but what was the thinking around portraying it like that? Well, I think life, exactly what Matali is saying, I think it's... Uh, Everyday life. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, small space living or smart space living, however you call it, I mean, uh, we, we live on smaller space, we do more activities uh, on, on sharing a space. You might uh, cook around the table, you might do the homework around the table, you might sit and do some tweeting or whatever you're doing. And I think sharing the space and allowing us to share, then it needs to cater for, for multiple activities. And uh, one of the things we... we put a lot of effort into actually the, the actual charging technology we're integrating into the tables and so on. We have actually tested it really so you can spill a cup of coffee on it and so on that it's completely safe to do that. And uh, you know, thinking about that in terms of really testing it for life at home. And uh, maybe that's typically a key to think about these, these things, but uh, we have to do that. And I think that is the beauty of how you work in a, in a, in a modern life at home perspective in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, it, we're kind of 
been talking for 45 minutes and I think we kind of have an hour and so I want to draw it back to the kind of here and now, the fact that we are at a kind of IKEA tem temporary in Milan, uh, during Milan Furniture Fair. Um, the event itself isn't necessarily meant to be kind of part of the furniture fair because it's going on for a much longer time but you know it's inevitable to see people like Ilse and Natalie that are here for the fair here within IKEA. So. Um, I was wanting to ask, what, what's your thinking around this this kind of interaction and this positioning? You know, uh, are you are you part of the fair, or do you see yourself in that industry and in that world, the design world, um, how it now looks? And you know, what, what what can you take from it, and what can they take from you? Um, I think that it's it's kind of a, an interesting kind of opposition going on where I think IKEA hasn't necessarily positioned itself within that field uh, very obviously before but there is a kind of move towards it or is there so I don't know maybe Marcus you're best position to comment on that. That's an interesting question. Now I, I think that it, or I do believe that we're we're not in of course we work with design but we're in the life at home business and uh, so it's it's a little bit different. And what we want to do while we're here, it's because we want to reach people with our idea and to change this idea around food and to present that to as many people as, as possible at the same time. So that's why we're here. And it's not about the Milan Fair as such, it's about the expo coming up also, which is going to be around food. So we're investing in like six months here in the midst of Milan to meet people who come to Milan who are interested in food and to share our knowledge with them and hopefully learn a lot. That's why we're here. So uh, I wouldn't say that it, it's, you know, we're not out there to, to uh, become that big design company, although we work with, with, with design. I'm working with uh, prominent girls like Matali and Ilse. It's not about their brands. It's about, for me at least, it's about, you know, some of those big names are also big thinkers. That's why we work together. So it's not about... It's not about branding at all, to be honest. It's about learnings. Yeah, it's, I, I make no differentiation. You know, in each project we do, there is a commercial aspect, there is a cultural aspect. So, so for me, it's just we are in the center of this, you know. So it, I, I don't know why design suddenly could be placed more in a commercial part, you know, or in a cultural part. It, it's just in the middle of the two, you know, and our ability is. Uh, to bring a sensible approach, a personal approach, to to look at things in a different way and to bring something uh, new and a little bit more elaborated, uh, and that's it. You know. So, for me, yeah, perhaps if we think more about the context of Milan, when the fair was inside the city, I think it was very much more easy to connect the commercial aspect and the cultural aspect. And now it's a little bit split. So it's a big pity because, uh, yeah. Uh, people are not sharing anymore uh, the same content, you know. You, you, so just so places like that is it's just what the makes sense right now because yeah, otherwise you you go more and more into these uh, two different ways of showing uh, objects, and then uh, they, it's not making things evolving, you know. Each year when you come here, it must be uh, bringing you energy, you know, to be a designer and not the opposite. You know, if you, I went to the fair yesterday, I'm not going to see everything because it's, it's taking my energy. But I, I go there to meet people and to discuss about the project we do together. So it's, it, it must be this kind of relationship, you know, uh, going on. So It's about people. Yeah, it's about people. No, it's not about things. Yeah. <clears throat> and design, after all, as a discipline, was exactly as Matalie says, invented as um, a fusion of commerce and culture. It was supposed to bring, you know, good quality to the many people. Like, as a discipline, it was invented to do that. So it shouldn't be odd at all that design and IKEA sit together. And more than that, there is the idea of uh, being able to talk about process, processes. It's becoming more and more important. We talk about food, but we, people want to know about the process, you know, before the, the food come arrive at home. It's the same with the furniture. So perhaps design could also be a help for showing this kind of process and also 
finding new methodology, like this for me is a new methodology also, you know, to be, to be tried and to be discussed and to be, you know, so it, for me it's, uh, it's uh, the next step is that, you know, it's to be m every, everybody and uh, every designer, every company must find a way to, to connect things and to make the people think about things more deeper, you know, so. Jerry? What Mark has mentioned, people. I, and we, we've been working for several years with a lot of different stories around food. And it's not actually that complicated. We said, what happens when people start changing the way they eat, either for a healthier way, either for a more economical way, either for different ways? And what changes does that make to life at home? And that's kind of a lot of the, the, the starting point where we started from for a lot of the product development that you, of the products you see here. Or, you know, people enjoying around the table, like this table, or different kind of kitchens that we've done. What happens when people change the way they eat, and what effect does that have on their home? It's very interesting for a company like IKEA. You can see, see that change also in, in uh, you know, when everybody talks about sustainable design. It used to be about making sustain products which were produced in a, in a sensible and sustainable way. But to us, that's not good enough. It's about designing things which change behaviors of people instead because that is so much bigger change, even for a mass production company like us. You know, making sustainable products, it's, it's like almost taken for granted. It's something that we have to do. But changing people's behaviors, that could change the world. So I think that's the future of design also. And then you have to go into the process, then you have to meet people, then you have to try out things like this, which is not an exhibition, it's not a store, it's not a restaurant, it's something else, it's like a meeting ground. And I think that's, uh, that's the ideas for the future that we have. And it might not look like this in a couple of weeks. It might look like something completely different because we try something completely different. So to round up, uh, I, I wanted to bring your attention to um, an exhibition or ex it's more of a, a presentation of a, um, a manifesto by uh, a designer that IKEA has worked with, uh, Hela Jongerius, uh, that's presented here in Milan. And reading the first part of the manifesto, uh, actually made me think a lot about the, the, the processes that IKEA goes through in, in terms of making products and how you work with people. So I'm going to read it and then I would like you to kind of all do a kind of maybe final, final comment on it in terms of where we think the future of design can go in relationship to the home, in relationship to technology and yeah, how people interact with it. So the, the first part, point of a manifesto is uh, count the blessings of industry. Industrial processes have greater potential than low volume productions of exclusive designs, which reach such limited market that talk of users can hardly be taken seriously. Industries can make high quality products available to many people. We should breathe new life into that ideal. And I think it seems really apt to consider this uh, in, in terms of uh, us sitting here in IKEA Tempore. And I just wanted to hear your reflections on, on, on this quote, and I should say it's by Hella Jongerius and Louise Schoenberg, uh, who's a professor at Design Academy Eindhoven. Marcus, do you want to...? Uh, for me, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's nothing new. Uh, it's the way that we have worked with in IKEA for years and years, actually, and I embrace the idea of that. It's utilizing the value chain, as we call it. The fact that we have worked with both uh, development on the home floor and on the factory floor, and met let them meet each other. That's the trick we have within IKEA. It's easy as that. And of course we should put our design resources in making a change and not making things. That doesn't make sense. So for me, I'm totally embracing it. Elsa? Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, what's not to like about making affordable, desirable, sustainable pieces that reach the many people? I mean, that is the design dream, isn't it? However, that doesn't mean that it's also not nice to have small scale local craft production, they can coexist. Um, but design is defined by reaching the many people, I think, you know, fundamentally, that's its task. Sherry? When, when, we, when we reach the many people, when we do something good, we make a huge effect. And now we're to, the Concept Kitchen is about sort of making people aware of behaviors around wastefulness in the kitchen. So I mean, on the scale that we're on, if we make that impact, we make a huge change. And I think that's a nice thing about being so big. Um, 
Nathalie? So I, it's, I think it's not new or so in my personal practice, you know. I, I, I do my best to each time to push a little bit and to bring something uh, more personal, you know. And I'm very happy with the product I, I did with IKEA because it's just in the middle of the two, you know. I, I, I feel my uh, uh, personality and also it's really integrated into the, the, uh, the, the spirit of IKEA. So you, you, you have the possibility to do it. It's just, uh, but it's a, a real, um, it's not a fight, it's a pleasure in the same time, you know. Each time you, you get a product to do, you know, to, to see as far as you can go and also to be uh, um, on, yeah, conscious of how you can make things evolve. So my practice is more about that, how people could act a little bit more, how they, they go from passive to active, you know. And, and uh, so I really like that because as soon as they, you, have, uh, you are active in your home, then you could be active a little bit in your area, in your world, you know. Yeah. So, but you need first to start with your home. And you feel, feel good here. If you experiment things in, in your home, then you feel, you feel better, you know, to exchange with the other and be able to change uh, on a bigger scale. So that's why I think it's very important to to this uh, at home. And as, as food is concerned, I mean, you, we will not ex, uh, expect big change from this uh, big agricultural company, you know. You know that people will be, will bring the change. So you just give them, if you just give, give them the good tools, you know, to make these changes happen in a very daily use, then it's okay. It will be long, you know, but uh, we know that it's not uh, in this way, but it's it's we really come from the we start from the people because uh, they 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 need to be conscious first, you know. I think it's uh, it's, it's difficult to generalize about uh, about industrialization and, and, and mass production. I mean, in terms of for IKEA, it's it's more about what you put in. If you put in good things into a production facility, you get good things out. So we need really smart, intelligent and craftsmen to tell the machines what to do, to enable, it's, it's just an enabler as technology, to enable uh, good things to the many people. So, but of course you need to be careful of, of what you're actually telling the machine or the mass production line to actually produce. So uh, good things in, good output. I think also what Hella doesn't maybe describe in words, but what I read into it is also the the effect you could get on design if you're close to production. If you're interested in really close to the production when you do it, that would make a major effect also. And that, that I could feel, actually visiting a lot of, of universities and meeting students, that if there's one thing that I could lack and I would like to see much more of is knowledge around production and production facilities and production possibilities because that's partly the mother of good design also, to have that knowledge. And that is something to take on. And that's also a responsibility for us as a big company to, to share our knowledge around production because we're skilled at it. So bring in new young talents and learn. That's uh, important. And production must be intelligent. That combination, I think, is also a defining characteristic of design. It is about coming up with intelligent alternatives that are informed. And that magic, that practical intelligence, is, I think, at the root of what Hella is saying. It's about doing stuff, not talking about it. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's time to do something. Let's. OK. <laughs> um, I think we rounded off there, and I want to thank you all for taking part and sharing some really interesting thoughts. And I mean, I'm, you know, as, as a magazine, we're very interested in all the things that we've been talking about here. So we would, in some way, like to share it, if we can. Uh, and then we'll see what, what happens from your end as well. So. Thank you for, for taking part and uh, have a good Milan. Yeah? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.